Well, this presentation this morning um, is about raw milk in all of its wonderful virtues. It's, uh, it's going to be kind of a broad discussion. We talk about all kinds of things about raw milk in the marketplace, the fairness, the crisis that's going on right now in a dairy, dairy and how you can kind of find a pathway through that. And uh, to a certain extent, I'll probably be speaking to the choir a little bit here too because so many of you are raw milk producers who found your way in the niche where, you lo- where you're located. And there's so many different niches. But my name is Mark McAfee. I am the owner of Organic Pastures Dairy, and I believe uh, we're, if not the largest, pretty much the largest organic raw milk dairy in the world. Uh, we have organic-based pastures systems, and then we have um, our cows and everything being taken into our processing plant on-farm. We produce milk in California, which is legal. Raw milk is entirely legal in California. Uh, and we sell in about 400 stores, and our cheese is sold nationally. All of that's raw. Uh, we have butter, cream, cheese, milk, kefir, um, all sold legally. So, as we all know, the raw milk markets are quite different across the United States, and every state has different rules and, and laws and everything else. But today is about producing low-risk raw milk, but also finding a pathway through this market crisis we have currently with all dairies, including organic dairies. So uh, that's that's the kind of the beginning. I'm also the um, vice president of the California Milk Campaign or the California Dairy Campaign, the CEC, um, which is kind of interesting because 20 years ago they thought I was an absolute crazy guy out there in the raw world, but now I'm actually been elected to represent all dairies at the table uh, as a diplomat, as a as a vice president to help uh, promote and support all dairies in the United States. Also part of the National Farmers Union. I've been going now for nine years to create policy. Uh, at the National Farmers Union, where we get together every year and talk about these policies and things. So um, with that, I'm also uh, the chairman and founder of the Raw Milk Institute. And I became very frustrated 10 years ago where we had people that were producing raw milk and people are getting sick and recalls and just giving it a bad name. And we said, you know what, there's no standards anywhere in the world that are universally accepted. There's no universal standards for raw milk. So the Raw Milk Institute was something I founded along with other, other friends, some PhDs and some veterinarians and other uh, raw milk producers, to create a standard. And we have those common standards now in their, their, third, uh, their third iteration now after 11 years. So let's just dive right into this and get going. Um, we do dairy different. Um, you do dairy different than what most people do when they produce milk for pasteurization. You serve a different customer than the milk for pasteurization customer does. The milk for pasteurization serve a creamery. And the guys who do the pasteurized milk don't know their customer. You as a raw milk producer know your customers because you sell directly to them. And you have a conversation with them. It makes a very unique difference in terms of what you do versus what um, the regular dairy does that sells for pasteurization, whether they be an organic dairy or a conventional dairy. Either way, they don't know their customers, which is a very unique place to be. And that makes you different, very different. Um, and to a certain extent, there's a lot of people that are jealous of you because of the price point and the, the ability to get direct information from your customers. It's entirely different. Um, there is a crisis right now in America that you may or may not know about. Uh, most of you probably do know that uh, a lot of dairies have been put up for sale. Two dairies a day are being lost in <coughs> Pennsylvania. We lose a dairy a week in California, which is incredible when you think about it. Um, and it's generally because of this massive consolidation that, thank you, go ahead, consolidation that's occurred. Well, we haven't lost any cows in America, but we've lost dairies like crazy. So the cows are moving from individual dairies onto big dairies, and you've got the Walmarting, the greenwashing going on. Let me get that one. Yeah, please. I'm, st- no, I'm stuck when I get it. Okay. <laughs> go ahead, go around me. Okay. And so what you've got is this massive consolidation with these huge capos, 10 to 15, 20,000 cow operations that are put in the most efficient areas to operate, where the most feed is, cheapest labor, and then they move the milk around the, the country instead of having local milk supply. So you see this really big crisis where you see organic milk prices dropping from $45 on hundred weight down to 22 or 28 And that's just a, a really bad situation because... The break-even production for the, even the most efficient organic dairy is about thirty to thirty-two to thirty to thirty thirty to thirty-two dollars a hundred weight. So what this does is, what does it ask the organic producer to do? Cheat. Becomes a race to the bottom because how are you going to produce this milk at this price if you don't go buy conventional feed or or whatever you can do to just get away with whatever you can do to survive? So the integrity of the organic market's been just eroded like crazy, um, and that's if you can get a contract. 
27 dairies in Northern California, Organic Valley dairies, were just canceled on their contracts this last month or so. 27 dairies. That's one third, one quarter to one third. There's only 100 organic dairies in California. They have lost a contract, don't know where their milk's going to go. So there's a real crisis going on. And it's because of these huge dairies that are going on in uh, Idaho, Colorado, and in Texas, where they've got between 10 and 20,000 cows each. When a regular dairy may have 200 cows, 100 cows, 300 cows on a regular, regular organic dairy. So you've got a real problem here. And these guys have been actually indicted before, had 14 federal charges brought against them, and just paid a $7.5 million fine, hired better attorneys and kept on going. They just took the bump and kept on going. And that persistence paid off because now they run the roost. they got national brands being bottled, and they're producing all kinds of milk. So a real corruption there in terms of what's going on in the national uh, situation. Um, the situation in Northern California is really critical because there isn't enough organic market in California to support those dairies that have lost their market share. Dean's Foods, you've probably heard, has gone bankrupt. Um, Dean's Foods is the Horizon Organic brand. And you've got Borden's just in the last couple weeks declaring bankruptcy after being around for almost 100 years. So uh, pretty, pretty incredible. A, a lot of this has to do with the fact that the dairy industry has underinvested in the market has not done a good job of educating, doing research, or anything else. Why is that? Well, when you steal milk from farmers at low cost, and there's no money from the farmers to do that investment, the processors don't do a very good job of investing in promotion and research. So where's the money? You've basically taken the money out of the market to exploit the market, and you end up with a bankrupt market. And that's what's going on. If you compare what's happening in America versus what's going on in Canada, you know that Canadian system... They spend three times more than we do on research and promotion. Three times more. But they have a supply management system. One where they match up the production with the demand, and they don't produce more than what's required. And for that, the farmers sit at the table to actually determine the milk price, and they don't have the processors telling them this is going to be the price. They negotiate it. The farmers on a regional basis sit down and say, Mr. Processor, how much milk would you like today? And they say, we would like to have X number of, of, of gallons of milk for this particular time period. They say, great, we're going to assure you you get that, but the price is going to be X. And the processor goes into the spreadsheet and says, X is the price. I can anticipate what it's going to be. And by the way, I don't have to move that, move that milk for 1,000 miles to get it here. It's going to come from 100 miles or 50 miles away, very close by. So it's predictable, it's smart and efficient, and as a result, the farmers in Canada are getting literally, they used to be last year, it was twice what in the United States, but um, you know, getting 28 to 30 bucks a hundredweight, roughly, for their milk on a conventional basis and double that for organic. And they're spending 2 to $3 a hundredweight for investing into promotion and education. So they have the money to plan for educating consumers to support the market. And what's interesting is the price point for the consumers is roughly the same here in the United States as it is in Canada. Because there's not so much waste. You can plan for it. It's efficient. So that's kind of the Canadian program, which is completely different than what we got going here. You don't see a dairyman going out of business in Canada. If they go out of business it's because they're retiring... They're retiring fairly wealthy and doing okay. Here in the United States, when they leave, it's because you have to. You've been displaced or you don't make enough money to survive. So there's a real crisis going on in America today. Origins of this came from the 1960s and early 1970s, where Earl Butts was the uh, Secretary of Agriculture for under uh, uh, Nixon. He said, get bigger, get out. That means basically consolidate. If you're a small guy, you're going to be eaten by the big fish. And um, when you hear the word organic, think starvation. These are the real things that were the cultural uh, concepts behind big ag that happened literally 50 years ago that now are really coming to uh, a head and showing that consolidation. So that's kind of the origins of where that all came from. Our current crisis in organic agriculture comes from the pasture rule being lack of enforced. What's interesting is I was sitting in a USDA meeting with the National Farmers Union two years ago in Washington, D.C., and... I rose to speak to the microphone and asked the undersecretary, uh, Gregory Ibach, and I asked him, I said, <clears throat> what about the enforcement of the past rule in these big mega dairies in uh, Colorado and, and Texas? He goes, oh, with the growth of organic sales, there's just a big misunderstanding. That's a quote. These larger organic dairies are just an industrial solution to the supply, consumer supply demand. And everybody in the room will go, what are you talking about? I was just lucky to get out there with a security detail because the bottom line was that was absolutely taking away all the value added of the producer that was actually following the pasture rule, which requires 120 days a year, 30% dry matter, given to the cows. And this big, these area operations are not doing that. 
So a major problem going on. It's basically cheap food at high societal cost, and uh, it, it's just they're dominating. These decapos are dominating the organic production model. That's uh, Sonny Purdue, and that's Gregory Abach right there. And Sonny Purdue is the Secretary of Agriculture who's supported Gregory in saying these things, and it's just not a good thing. It's, it's horribly corrupt, and it's causing a major problem. So uh, one of the things that... Uh, Mr. Rodale said back in the 60s was, it's not organic to produce organic milk and then pasteurize it. And back then, organic milk was not defined. There was no real definition of what the standard was back in the 60s and 70s. It was just something that was done voluntarily by pioneers, right? We knew that organic milk would be a pasture-based cow, that you wouldn't use hormones, that it wouldn't use antibiotics, it would be all natural. And so that's what he said back then. And these words literally are now haunting us today about the fact that what what real organic or, or biologic or ecologic or consumer-connected and nature-connected milk would be, which would be produced here um, on cows and pasture. So major, major problems going on here in terms of corruption and all these issues going on with the fact that inspectors schedule their inspections for these organic dairies at the wintertime when you don't have pastures. So they can get away with saying, oh, okay, I'll take your word for it. You did, you did pasturing last, last summer. In fact, they did not. So now you've got eight massive capo dairies that displace hundreds of compliant dairies and it's causing bankruptcies left and right. So that's the underlying crisis we've got in America. Pathways forward. It's interesting. Press for enforcement of the USDA regulations with lobbying, lawsuits, and all that kind of stuff. Try that. That's actually going on now. The three-legged milk stool with is a growth, growth management thing, which is this little baby right here. There's actually seven of these milk stools that were built in, and are actually around America today trying to get farmers to work together so that we don't work against each other and eat each other alive and be a little bit more Canadian in the way we think in terms of collaboration together so we control how much we produce so we don't oversupply and, in fact, demand enough money for our milk that we can actually thrive. And in doing so, the entire food chain thrives because when a dairy dies, a local community around that dairy cries. It, lo it loses its ability to pay its bills. It can't buy feed. It suffers. So it's kind of interesting uh, that... that We've seen that. We've seen things get really, really big and blow up and then become a microchasm again. It kind of becomes a raw milk, a really small, connected, local dairy that kind of takes over from the scraps of the explosion that occurred from the big dairy being dissolved. And then build your own value-added system outside of the system. And I think that's what we all have here done, is actually design our own darn system. The other one doesn't work. For the consumers, the cows, the environment, or for anything, the economics or anything, create our own system outside of the system. So uh, uh, this is T.J. Cox. The old milk stool back there in Washington, D.C. This is Sonny Verdun here. I gave him a milk stool. He said he's going to put it in his office in Washington, D.C. And I'm not sure if it's there. He threw it in the dumpster. I'm not sure. But the bottom line was he actually <coughs> was at a presentation <coughs> near my local <coughs> in a local town in California in Las Vegas, where I actually presented in front of him saying, listen, stop the madness. Let's start creating a better system for America. Let's, let's pass a congressional act where you no longer have to pay massive subsidies, handouts, trade subsidies to these farmers because, in fact, they're sustainable and they make money themselves by controlling their oversupply and having it match demand. And it was like, well, that's not American. I said, well, I'm sorry. Let's adapt to systems that are perhaps a little bit better for America because it's certainly not help, helping America at all. So we developed this idea, and this is something that's got a lot of broad support across America today. Even the Farm Bureau has started to, to say it's a good idea, which is kind of interesting. They're very conservative guys. Um, the National Farmers Union has supported it. And there's a lot of movement right now. That's the broader, bigger dairy thing. Not the micro chasm we got going to Consumer Direct, but the broader dairy thing. So there's three things we can do there in terms of fixing the American problem. What do they look like? Well, the problem is lawsuits time, take time and money, and farmers don't have any time or money. So that's not going to be really easy to do. Growth management takes an act of Congress. It requires farmers to work together in cooperation. This is an ongoing effort, but it's really, really hard when I get together with big dairymen in a room to get them to agree on anything. And the more pain you apply, with prices being low, uh, the more they tend to start to agree that maybe something needs to be, be done. But unfortunately, these guys have these huge operations that are well-connected. They want the little guys to die off. So saying, I wish the milk price would drop even more so you guys would die off and I'll be the only king left in the hill. Well, how good has that worked for the last 60 years? Not very well at all. In fact, it's just been a self-fulfilling prophecy that, in fact, bigger, bigger guys die off too. Bordens, Deans, those are pretty big, huge operations. They're dying off now too from, from lack of industrial, uh, from lack of, of considering the ramifications of what they're doing. 
Um, and then the reinvention of your own uh, dairy brand or your own direct uh, consumer marketing is what we're talking about today. Uh, the Real Organic Project, add-on labels, I don't know where that's going to go because you have to educate consumers what this means. And consumers are fairly naive. It's a huge offer, uh, uh, thing, endeavor to get a, a, a new sticker on a product in a store and say, this means something different. Consumers are totally confused, and there's all this market confusion. You can do this direct sales here and go raw, and that's what we've done here. And then you can make raw cheese. Raw cheese can be made and sold across America. And unique artisanal cheeses are very high value added. Uh, it's not cheap to do. You've got to build your own facility. But I tell you what, if you can make a really good artisanal cheese that's got a unique thing, it's been cage-aged, it's truly raw, comes from grass-fed, pastured cows, whatever that might be, um, with your name on it, you might be able to do really well with that. But it's a competitive market, and it takes vision, and it takes a lot of hard work. It's not easy. There's something free here. So different pathways to, to go forward. Um, organic dairies really have to look hard at themselves and understand what they're doing and how they're doing it because they're, they've lost their differentiation between them and some massively efficient, efficient CAFO that's eating their lunch. Add-on certifications, like I said, I'm, I'm not sure how they're going to do there. Who is their buyer? If the buyer is a processor, what's that processor doing for them? Processors aren't doing a lot for the dairies right now. They're just cutting up the contracts and going for the cheaper guy. So that's not helping either. And uh, as a consumer, you have to really spend a lot of time to teach and educate the consumer. Uh, there's a lot of label confusion. If you go to a store and look at how many labels there are, and the add-on labels on the labels, it'll give you a headache. Plant-based, plant-based, organic, uh, you know, DST-free, non-GMO. I mean, you just name it. Consumers are going, I just want to eat today. <laughs> you know, totally confused. So it's really tough. How do you differentiate yourself and how do you push forward to get more money to your farm and respond better to your consumer? It's not an easy process to go through. The onslaught of milk alternatives has really changed the whole thing up because... These products, uh, generally speaking, have not been around a long time. Almond milk's been around for a little while, but the bottom line is these are creative, created. Uh, these are products created in a lab to satisfy a challenge, and that is uh, we want to get really cheap, we want it to look like milk, we'll lubricate the cereal for breakfast, basically. Uh, but you're, you're, I say that, and a lot of people that are in the raw milk movement believe this is true, that these came about as a consumer rejection of processed milk. People said, I can't tolerate processed milk because it's allergenic. It's the number one most allergenic food in America, and it's hard to digest. So give me something that doesn't give me gas, pain, or allergies, and that would look like something like an almond milk or a uh, you know, pecan milk or a, a coconut milk or some, a soy milk or something that doesn't have lactose because of the lactic digestion issues. Well, raw milk does not generally have those problems because it's a whole food. It has all the enzymes and bacteria and all those things in there that are wonderful in helping it digest itself. So we've had a major onslaught, onslaught of it, pushing on the market even more, adding to the crisis even further. So um, raw milk is just like cute milk. And if you think about babies, they thrive on mom's milk. And if you think about what that milk is, it's not just milk. It's made up of a million things that we've studied as scientists at the International Milk Genomics Consortium and other places around the world to figure out what it is that makes milk. It's literally a transfer mechanism from mom to baby to, to, to move all the uh, immunoglobulins and all the immune factors at birth. It's a uh, complete food. It's a whole food. It's got enzymes, bacteria, fat. It's got all kinds of wonderful probiotic bacteria. 700 different kinds of bacteria found in breast milk alone. Well, raw milk is much like breast milk. And the fact that it's literally the evolutionary food, the pressures of all time, that has been created to have that optimal choice, chance of survival for that next generation, the optimal highest level, highest best food to have that baby thrive in the next generation. So it's a very valuable thing. But the thing is, is that when you process it, you lose that value. And there's a chart in one of those handouts I gave you that shows all of the things found in, in, in milk, or at least the first 20 things, and they're all changed in processing. You'll find it in there. And it's very interesting to see that because it goes from an incredibly powerful immune system supporting food to one that's highly allergenic, hard to digest, and a partial food. So what we're producing is a whole food that's fantastic for the immune system and much like what we produce for our babies as a first-generation food, uh, first food of, of the next generation to optimize um, 
the survival of that next generation. And when research is performed on milk, it's human milk that's the gold standard for study. That's what scientists look at in terms of looking at human nutrition, especially in children. So pretty powerful here in terms of what's going on here uh, to give kind of a correlation of the value of what milk is all about. It's interesting to note that in California, the California Milk Processors Board uh, does a, a study every year, and they spend a million bucks on this research. And in the research, one of the pages, which I, I brought the manual here today, uh, shows cultural trends in California. It shows that these are the highest cultural trends when it comes to the dairy case. Plant-based, farm to table, that's what you guys won't be doing with raw. Ethical and eco-conscious, in other words, pasture-based, taking good care of the animals. Um, organic or slash unprocessed. They didn't have a guts to use the word raw there. <laughs> but unprocessed. And gut health. These are all the boxes that consumers are checking now when they're going to buy products at the store. So we have come up on the radar screen because they put this unprocessed word there because, in fact, of the impact of the California markets on dairy consumption, the people that are buying raw milk now. So it's really interesting to see that we are up on the radar screen here now where I know our dairy is the number one selling uh, milk in California at sprout stores, whether it be pasteurized or raw, either way the number one selling uh, category, the market category, and number two nationally for sprouts in 332 stores. So it's coming into the place, it's coming into the marketplace, which is pretty profound, but these are not my words. These are the words coming from a marketing research firm that spent millions of dollars on conventional milk marketing research. So we're coming up on the radar screen, so it's pretty powerful. So when you reinvent dairy, you have to appreciate lessons for the consumer. Really appreciate these lessons. Anybody can produce it, but can you sell it? Can you sell it? And what we always say is you don't sell raw milk, you teach it. So if somebody comes to your farm, you don't say, would you like some raw milk? Yeah, you'll say that. But you need to also say, here's why you would want raw milk. Have you heard the benefits of it? You would talk about all the things we talked about today, and you would explain to them. You would do everything you can to educate them as to how raw milk would be so good for them, and that it's delicious. The number one thing that people uh, respond to when asked in polled why do you drink raw milk? Oh, my God, it's delicious, the first thing they say. And then they come on and say, oh, it's gut friendly, it doesn't cause gas pain, easy to digest, it's not allergenic. They'll have other comments as well. Or it's, you take good care of your cows, I can come visit you, you pasture your cows, it's unprocessed. There's other things people say too, but the number one thing they say is, oh, my gosh, it's delicious. Yes? A couple things. One, how does your expiration date work into competing with store-bought. Very interesting point. And the other thing yep. is taste. Mm -hmm. Depending on what you feed and what time of year gets, things get fed, you can taste what's in that milk versus the dead stuff in the store. Correct. And it's interesting that our shelf life is 18 days, which is pretty darn competitive with pasteurized, which is between 18 and 22 days. <laughs> It's more like about three weeks of pasteurized. Well, that's 21 days. 21 days. And we're 18 days on raw. But remember, when we're at stores, we have to make sure that product is fresh every week. So we have a truck going to that store every week to change out that product to assure that the milk is fresh every week so that that next week is totally fresh as well. So being a retail supplier of, of milk is a whole different level of challenge in terms of running a truck, making sure you always only leave the most... Uh, freshest product and all that stuff versus on farm which is an entirely different thing because you have direct consumer sales where they know exactly what's going on and you're very much connected to them but it's interesting that it's 18 days we didn't have 18 days uh 10 years ago we had like 12 days because we embraced some really high technologies in terms of understanding what's going on with our raw milk and doing frequent testing we got an extra week how do we do that by having super low bacteria counts because we kept it extra cold, extra clean, and we maintain that cold chain. And as a, as a result, we get an extra few days. Because remember, shelf life has to do with biological activity of the milk. You let it get warm, it's going to start to ferment, right? It's going to become sour. It wants to become kefir and yogurt and cheese. If you want it to be fresh raw milk, you have to start out super clean and keep it, keep it super cold. And that way you get that nice long shelf life. If you start breaking the cold chain and let it get warm, it's got a short shelf life, as you know. Yeah, see, that's, that, that's the problem we were running into, where you'd have the first day of production right on the shelf. People would take it home. Five to seven days later, they come back and say, my milk is bad. 
you have to you have to be careful with what you're doing on the production side. We're going to talk about that. That's why I brought my old milk claw over here. There's some things to think about, and we're going to jump into that big time here in just a second. I can contribute a little bit because I do customer service on the farm, and I do uh, get those questions, and it has just been educating the consumers. In our hot summers, they have to have an ice chest when they go to the store. You can't throw it in the back of your car and take two more stops. And so we guarantee ourselves, we go that next step that if someone is not satisfied, and uh, most of the time, I mean, we don't have that big of an issue, but if there's like out of a gallon a little bit left and they want a free gallon, you know, you <laughs> might be okay with that the first time and you educate them. The next time you're going, yeah, no. But uh, just the effort, the 20 years of explaining to them it's perishable, and I use the terminology of being perishable, imagine raspberries. When you buy raspberries and you get it home, you might have one or two frozen in that pint. You paid $8 for a pint in California of organic Driscoll raspberries. But if you think you're going to have it outside on your counter and have it last more than a day, so you try to get them to your Think of milk as like other perishable items, but also just educating them, keeping it cold, and keeping the, don't keep the cap, cap off for long, because <coughs> oxygen starts this whole process. So 20 years of educating, they're getting the hint, and they're getting much better, so we have less complaints. When you go about trying to build your market, you can really, 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 really rely on some excellent studies that are being done right now. If you look at the benefits, uh, the studies are being done in Europe, not in the United States. In the United States, there's no money to do any studies at all on raw milk. In fact, the big processing guys think raw milk is the worst thing in the world because guess what? They don't get to process it. It bypasses them from the farm to consumer versus going through the plant where they make their money. So, easier to digest, strong immune systems, fewer ear infections, less asthma, fewer allergies, reduced eczema, fewer colds, and improved gut health. These are all things coming out of these big universities in Europe and also being promoted right now by the universities at UC Davis with the International Milk Genomics Consortium. So very, very powerful immunological benefits that you need to share with your consumers so they can tell somebody else to keep your market strong and to increase the value you've got with your, your products. Very, very important. There's two kinds of raw milk, guys. Raw milk intended for pasteurization and raw milk intended for human consumption. Left, and, left is human consumption, right is for pasteurization. That milk sock filter was found at a neighbor's dairy that sold off to be pasteurized, grade A. And this is from our dairy, grade A as well, but for raw milk for human consumption. We actually study these. We don't study them anymore. We do some other things. But we used to study these to look at how clean they were on a comparative basis every day. This guy, didn't, he threw them in the back of his truck. That's with his truck bed right there. So that's how much that matters to him. It was basically a cleaner to keep the crap out. He didn't care. He was laying in his truck. I just grabbed it. But uh, it, it's... It, it is what it is. He's not paid any differently He's for that milk. Too. He's out of business, yeah. Uh, the bottom line is that milk, he doesn't get paid a premium to have it clean. He hasn't paid a premium to get more butterfat or protein, but not to keep it clean. We're paying a premium over here if it's safe and if it's clean. So different customers, different things, right? Pretty interesting. So two kinds of raw milk here in America, uh, one for pasteurized and one for humans. So what's your story? I think I've heard most of your story. You guys are already going directly to the consumer, and you actually... The, the evolution is complete here. You, the big dairies are gone. And the little dairies are spoken up to take care of the people directly on the street and, or um, on the farm, which is great. Good to see that. But it also shows the disaster of what's happened in the dairy community by not responding to consumers. They destroyed themselves. It was quite poor. Um, I've already talked about this, but you're going to see this coming along. Um, it may not affect you so much, but for the bigger dairy operations, uh, it absolutely has an effect on everyone. And dairying together versus hoping the other guy dies is kind of an important concept in terms of, of staying strong together. It's very, very important because you start cutting each other's throats. Uh, I've seen a little bit of that going on even in the raw milk community. And it has to do with the fact that one guy will be producing outstanding raw milk, investing a lot in cleaning his, keeping his milk super clean and doing a great job. It's interesting ghost here. Um, and then somebody else comes in at half the price and starts selling milk to people. And undercuts them by a bunch of price, but it's not doing the investment to do the clean operations and so on and so forth. And so you see this market robbing back and forth. So we're always saying, hey, listen, as long as each individual farmer continues to teach, to teach raw milk and build market, there'll always be enough market share for everyone. But if we stop, stop teaching, we start stop promoting the benefits of raw milk and start to, uh, talking about me and being cheaper, you're going to be in trouble. 
So it's really important to make sure you stay, ed, uh, stay ed, uh, as an educational force to be reckoned with as a Rama brand, a local on-farm Rama brand. We always promote so you have more people wanting your milk and there will be more market share available. Because if you don't do that, uh, you will be in a competition where it will be not so pretty. And there will be a, a importance to actually work together a little bit uh, to build market for raw as well as uh, conventional and organic and everybody else working together. So everybody has to really work together to have this be sustainable. Okay, let's talk about risk management here. We've got about half an hour or we've got another hour here. We're going to really dive into this to understand it more deeply and understand some of the technologies we're talking about to get the 18 day shelf life or even longer. Um, again, we've gone through all this stuff here. I'm going to get into that. But I am certified in asset management from a long time ago. I'm actually my second, my first uh, chapter in life was a farm, a hobby farmer, but that was a certified paramedic and medical educator for uh, 17 years of my life. My wife's an RN, uh, delivered a bunch of babies. Uh, so we come from a medical background, which kind of gives me a different ability to talk about medicine in terms of the immune system and so on and so forth. And this is our family team here. Um, my son, my daughter, my mom, all our grandkids, and cows. So it is a family operation. Uh, we're going to talk about the raw milk Institute a little bit, the uh, status of raw milk and all of its opposition, the various different things across the, the food chain from literally from grass to glass, and then testing technologies and talk about how you can be listed if you want to become listed. If you don't want to be listed, great. Just take the information we have here and go online and take the information we have there and apply it. And you'll, you'll hear what I'm saying when I say listed being certified with the raw milk Institute. You don't have to get all of our benefits for being listed. You can do it another way. Uh, listed is kind of a pain. You have to develop your food safety plan and engage yourself to actually become listed, but it will help you with your insurance big time. The insurance companies go, whoa, you got an insurance, you got a, uh, a certification here, and they look at the risk profile, and they go, we'll, we'll, we'll cut your rate. So that's really good if you're doing some kind of retail or some kind of a place where you need insurance. The insurance will drop dramatically. We saw it go from $8,000 from one farmer down to $700 from a farmer. That was in Oregon. Uh, our rates have dropped dramatically in the last few years because of the results we get from this program as well. 8,000 for how many cows? They're milking three. 8,000 $8, a year for milking three cows is what the insurance program in, Cal in Oregon was. It went from that to $700. $700 a year versus 8,000 a year. Charlotte Smith. Yep. Dramatic is one tenth because she could show what the risk profile of her milk was before she couldn't. And after doing testing and having a written protocol, she could show the profile of her, of her risk profile dropping dramatically. So pretty powerful what, what the compelling argue, argument can be made that, in fact, my milk is not high risk, it's very low risk, and you can prove it. So that's kind of a, a really important thing that the Raw Milk Institute can bring to you. It's a nonprofit. It's not for-profit. It doesn't cost you anything to do this process. Uh, we have a grant we operate under, by the, under the 11th Hour Fund by the Google Foundation. Uh, which is about sustainable food and agriculture and soils. We're really a big soils organization in terms of trying to create mm -hmm. pastures and cows on pastures as the, the primary basis to start your raw milk production process. But our mission is to improve safety and the quality of raw milk and raw milk products through farmer training and mentoring. Farmer training and mentoring is interesting. Mentoring is sharing amongst each other and working for best practices. And training being, okay, guys, here's a set of standards you need to follow. That stuff you used to do with pasteurization doesn't work anymore. You need to be able to hear to prevent pathogens to begin with so you don't have to pasteurize. So very important. Establish raw milk guidelines and standards. We have those standards here. The whole website dedicated to this at the rawmilkinstitute.org. Educating consumers about the health benefits of raw milk when it's produced safely and cleanly. Very important that you have the tools so you can build the market. How are you going to do it and say, oh, yeah, I heard raw milk's good. Try it. See if it works for you. That's not the way you sell raw milk. You need to say, guys, we know this. We participated in this the study. This is the stuff, that, stuff you can really use as a reference point in your own lives. And by the way, if your kid has eczema, it improves eczema. If your child has asthma, it makes it get better. If you've got problems with your gut, you've got celiac or you've got Crohn's disease, raw milk kefir, which you can make at home, makes it get better. In fact, you can avoid that surgery you're going to have in three weeks. This whole website is dedicated to the fact that Crohn's goes away with consumption of raw dairy. And a whole food diet, by the way. If you, if you drink raw dairy and have a crappy diet, you're probably going <laughs> to go down that same thing. But if you drink raw kefir and you have a whole food diet, you set up the circumstances in your gut, you actually have the conditions are, are, are not right for Crohn's disease at all. In fact, they get better and better. Welcome. Good morning. Hi. Hi. Lydia, I'm just popping in for a second. Wonderful. Great. Well, we've got 
through all the, the warfare stuff in the beginning, and now we're talking about the resolution, how to make safe, wonderful, delicious, well known. The interesting thing about that is when you collect data from the farmers that are actually doing these things, and you get that database, we're up to 15,000 data points of collection right now, and we're going to have 18,000 uh, this year. 15,000 data points showing the dramatic reduction of, of, of risk based on the bacterial counts, the pathogen tests, and the coliforms being super, super low, pathogens being at zero, literally. They're not always zero, but they're pretty darn close to zero when you look at the data. Then what you can do is prove that, in fact, raw milk production is a very, very, very low-risk program. And when you do that, you have then made yourself look much more safe than you did before, where it was unknown. So this is what we're doing at the Raw Milk Institute, which is pretty profound when you think about risk profile. If you hear the CDC and the FDA, they're always saying, oh, one drop will kill you. When, in fact, that's not true at all. When you adopt good practices from grass to glass and you do testing and you have high standards, the profile completely changes. It's an entirely different food. So, pretty powerful there. Uh, we've trained uh, 330 farmers in North America um, on these principles and concepts. And um, we have 19 farmers actually listed. They're committed to producing this milk and actually submitting their bacterial counts on a monthly basis. We submit our bacteria counts on organic pastures literally every day, and certainly every week. We're using some different technology than most dairymen, but to get this low-risk milk, you don't have to test every day. But you need to test frequently to know if your program works or not. The last thing in the world you want to do is have a program and not know if it works. Have a program, you want to validate and verify it, you want to do it frequently to understand that, in fact, you're not doing a, a, a major a diversion from it. So... Our goal is to have universal access to safe raw milk or low-risk raw milk across the world for those that want it. Now, there's going to be places in the world that will be very, very hard to get a universally acceptable raw milk. For instance, India. India is a pretty tough place. A lot of raw milk being sold there, a lot of tuberculosis in the cows. And there's their testing protocols for tuberculosis and brucellosis. And so people buy their raw milk and they take it home and boil it. <laughs> so where's the real value there? The bottom line is we're trying to work on a basis where in the U.K., we're working with 170 dairymen through one of our, our, our ex-board members actually did a bunch of work there to actually improve their standards. We're working the, with the New Zealand and Australia, and we've worked in North, in North America and Canada and the United States extensively to actually have this universal access. The voice against raw milk is pretty much universal between the processors and the FDA. The processors and the FDA are very much in bed together at the National Conference, National Conference of Interstate Milk Shipments, the NCIMS, which is the Pasteurized Milk Ordinance, which regulates the production and processing of milk. They have one standard universally at the federal level. One standard. That standard is for processing only. They have no standards for raw milk except that it's illegal. That's why state standards are the ones that prevail. There's no federal standards for raw milk for human consumption. Only state standards, which is a potch, you know, kind of a chaotic puzzle piece. You know, California's legal, Arizona's legal, Pennsylvania's legal, but then other states may be illegal on the farm. It's all over the place. There's no universal standards. So the voice against it is pretty much united including the AMA, the American Medical Association, who kind of follows the mantra from the FDA, unfortunately. So it is interesting to note that the DOs, the doctors of osteopathy, and the chiropractors have a completely different philosophy about raw milk than the, the MDs, the medical doctors do. They have different nutritional training, and they study lactation and human lactation, understand the benefits of breastfeeding, and they actually come out a lot more in support of raw milk than the guys that don't get nutritional training and don't have a lot of lactation training, which is very interesting to note that. Um, we have this massive chaos going on with lots of chaos on the store shelves. Uh, Canada, it's completely illegal, but everywhere I've gone in Canada to speak about raw milk, they always have raw milk available. It's interesting. Wherever people want it, they generally get it. Kind of like the drug trade, except it's not. It's the food trade, right? It's moonshine, uh, where people always get their raw milk from some trusted local source, whether it be Underground, whether it be above ground, whether it be legal or illegal, people find their cow or their goat, as you've got over there, your goats. So it's interesting. Um, consumers absolutely love it because it's so good for the immune system, so good for bone strength, and children thrive on it. Children especially thrive on it. Bone strength, immune systems, and all those things we've listed with the ear infections being decreased, the asthma allergies, and, and doing well. Um, they poop better, too. Kids just do really, really well. Their gut works really, really well. When you do that. Uh, this is that same chart that's in the little brochure that I handed out, but I go to the International Milk Genomics Consortium Confer conferences every year, and the Raw Milk Institute is actually a sponsor now. This, this year we became a sponsor. Now, 
at the IMGC, which is held all over the world, this, this year was in Aarhus, Denmark, you got a room full of 100, this year was 95, world-renowned milk researchers, a lot of lactation experts. And for basically four days, they talk about all the newest, greatest stuff coming out. The research from Oxford University in England were saying, the next thing that's going to be coming out here soon is the bioavailability listed on the label of, of consumer products. So when you see a consumer label, it's going to say, the bioavailability availability rating of this product is X. It's high or it's low, or it's rated 1 to 10. What does that mean? That means that calcium pills don't work. They're looking at the whole food matrix with the calcium. Because if you don't have the fatty acids and all the profile things around it, the calcium just goes through your gut. So the availability of a mineral has to do with the matrix around it, not just the mineral itself. And so the best researchers of the world are saying, listen, wake up, guys. It's the whole food that matters, not the pill. We've done that as farmers for a long, long time, that you can't just put a, a, some kind of a thing in the soil and expect it to work. You have to, have, uh, you have to build a biome in the soil for it to work, a living biome. The earthworms have to crawl. Things have to work. There has to be living stuff there. You can't just kill everything and expect it to live. So this list of things right here, all these elements found, is literally the short list. It would go on all the way to the floor and all the way down to the 20 feet if you were going to do it. Because there's things they're finding all the time down in milk that they don't truly understand or completely understand. All these found are living elements that work together. They're in balance, living together. The enzymes are active. The bacteria are active. The proteins are whole and not denatured. And what you find is that's the background matrix that hold the elements of the proteins, the fats, and the minerals, and the have it all work together as a living organism, literally. And when you pasteurize it, you no longer have those values there. They are no longer working. That's why you have so many allergies, a lack of digestion, and all these issues that happen in pasteurized milk. But in the whole form, all kinds of great stuff, great stuff going on. From mom to baby, mom to baby, mom to baby. And the same thing, you go cow to people, cow to people. So you see raw human milk, all these active issues, and cow's milk, the same thing. The same would be true for goat's milk, by the way. But goat milk would be a slightly different protein. The butterfat's of one-third is large, so on and so forth. Um, one of my favorite ones to talk about is the old phosphatase enzyme. My favorite enzyme to talk about. It's the third most prevalent enzyme found in raw milk, in breast milk. Third most. What's the test for effective pasteurization called? You guys don't know? You're raw guys. It's the negative alpha phosphatase test. So when you cook the milk to 165 degrees in 15 seconds, or 145 degrees in 30 minutes, or 282 degrees in 5 seconds, whatever that might be, that enzyme's gone. It's been denatured entirely. Alpha phosphatase. Big studies done in Europe show that it is a very, very powerful anti-inflammatory enzyme. It decreases inflammation. We now know from the science that inflammation drives chronic infection, chronic disease processes. Not infection, chronic disease. Inflammation is what triggers your body to fight itself, cause issues with chronic disease. So if you have low inflammation, your body's at peace. In inflammation, your body's at war. And at war, you start getting cancers and all kinds of issues. This alkaline phosphate enzyme is found in truly raw cheese. It's never been heated. It's found in raw dairy. It's found in raw butter. It's found in... Very high levels of raw butter because guess where the alkaline phosphatase enzyme, most of it sits. 50% of it sits in the butterfat molecule. So when you pasteurize butterfat, that enzyme doesn't have a place to be anymore. When you heat it, it absolutely destroys the enzyme itself. Proper, it's, its enzyme is destroyed, it's no longer active. You no longer have the, the anti-inflammatory process going on. So the alkaline phosphatase is a very important point. That's just one of these things. Add them all up, you've got a superfood. But this is a really powerful thing all in itself that's completely destroyed in pasteurization. That's just a small example of a big, big list of things here that all work together. They work together like if you want to say God, you want to say or evolution, choose your, your concept in terms of belief. But they're intended to be the optimal food for the next generation to thrive. And if you look at America today, our kids are not thriving. They're having a heck of a time. Obesity, diabetes, asthma is a chronic, it's, a, it's just a disaster because of the highly processed garbage that are being fed to these kids with a lot of sugar, a lot of extra carbs, a lot of processed stuff, preservatives, antibiotics. When they get sick, they get antibiotics, which is very gut destructive. 
Because remember, the gut is filled with good bacteria that digests all this stuff. So this is a very important little chart you have there that actually is, a, is a kind of a, a, a very important thing for people to appreciate and realize about what's in milk and appreciate the value of what's in milk. Uh, Mark? Yes, sir. Uh, what was the name of that institute? Was it the Low Milk Genomics? International Milk Genomics Consortium, the IMGC. IMGC. Yep. Again, this is a short list of things that Rama has benefits with. We won't do it anymore. Um, but here's the thing. There are risks of raw milk. You get really sick, really sick with raw milk. And we do not ignore that. We do not suppress that information. We put it right there in the top because we want people to realize, wake up, guys, as raw milk producers, recognize the risks. And mediate them. Do something about them so you don't have them. And we know that E. coli 01587 is probably the most serious risk because so few cells, so few of these bacteria can actually cause hemolytic uremic syndrome in, in children especially. Especially when a child does not have a good gut. When they, their gut mucosal lining, the mucus that lines the gut, that actually protects them from having a violation of bad bugs, is missing or it's thin, the bacteria that may be found in a food goes through and it connects to the tissues in the gut and can actually trigger hemolytic uremic syndrome or the shigatoxin reaction, causing sepsis. Put kids in the ICU and lose their kidneys and all kinds of horrible things. So E. coli is 797. Uh, scientists tell her that as, as few as 10 cells can trigger that. So we've got to be darn well sure we don't have this pathogen. Salmonella takes a very lo high load of those cells to cause illness in uh, a host, but it certainly can cause illness. Campylobacter, the interesting thing about Campylobacter, it's found all over our farm. <laughs> There's a 1,000 Campylobacter cases a day diagnosed in America. It's everywhere. Everybody's got a cat that is in your house, you got Campylobacter. Chickens got Campylobacter from the store. <clears throat> it's everywhere. A lot of people have problems with Campylobacter because they're not on the farm. If you're on the farm, you've got a tiger. You've got an antibody to Campylobacter because you're exposed to chickens and you're next to the cows. You've got immunity already. But those that come to your farm or those that are not on the farm may not have that. And when you have the immunity, when you start to transfer the immunity, it can cause a lot of, of diarrhea, fever, make you feel sick. And the worst case, you can actually end up at the hospital. And there's been a few cases of people that die from it. But once you've had it once, you're immune for life. You're good to go. So it's kind of a natural inoculation that occurs, a vaccination that occurs by being connected to farm animals or animals and actually having that whole uh, kind of natural vaccination process occur. Uh, Listeria monocytogenes, it takes a load again to actually cause illness. But remember, remember the host. The host is the consumer. When the host is weakened, it takes less of these bad bugs to make that host sick. In America, we have weak hosts. Our hosts are not healthy. So we have to be game on as producers to make sure that we don't have bad bugs in our milk by doing a very good job on the farm to assure that the consumer doesn't get exposed to bad bugs at a high level to make them sick. Four things must occur for a human to get sick. A pathogen must be present. If there's no pathogen there, there's nothing to trigger the human to get sick. So pathogens are disease-causing bacterium or organisms. It could be a virus as well. Disease-causing pathogen. The genesis, the beginning of pathogen. Patho is the process of the illness. So pathogens must be present. The pathogen must be virulent. If it doesn't have the DNA inside of it to trigger illness, then it just goes through, who cares? So it must be a virulent pathogen. It must have the genetic information to make you sick. And, and the last two here, the pathogen load, in other words, there has to be enough of them to trigger illness. If you have just onesie twosies, eh, your body could kick it, kick it out, no big deal. But if you get a whole load of them, and you're susceptible, don't have the immunity, then you get sick. And last is, the host must be susceptible. In other words, I don't have the experience, the antibodies that have been created to resist that infection. I don't have my natural vaccination going on. So those are four things that must happen. It's our job as raw producers to make sure that these four things never line up. Don't let them line up. Knock one out. Knock two out. Knock all four out. I'm always trying to build strong hosts by having good a diet, you know, a good nutritional basis in our consumers. Pathogen loads being super low or zero. My goal is zero. Pathogen must be virulent. We don't like pathogen. Uh, if you stop antibiotic use on your farm, you would stop triggering the, the series of events that occur that causes uh, uh, bacteria to become resistant to antibiotics and becoming virulent. And pathogen is present. That's a sanitation issue and testing. Here's some more about pathogens, but chicken talk is producing uh, Escherichia coli. 
E. coli uh, has the lowest uh, bacterial count necessary to trigger illness. That's why we, we treat it number one. This is our number one biggest thing we look, work on is making sure we do not have that pathogen in our milk or anywhere near our milk. It could be as few as five cells. Kidney damage, this is what kid, put, keeps the kids in the hospital and creates press all over the place and liability attorneys come and say, I'm going to take your farm. Not pretty. I know I've done this. I speak from experience. Been many years ago, but our insurance policy had to pay, and it was very serious stuff. I didn't sleep well at all. I felt horrible. Moms hated my guts. It was horrible. Um, but we did not go out of business. What we did, we stood up and said, I take responsibility for it, and I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to test. I'm going to do whatever i got to do to make sure it doesn't happen again. And what do you know? That has occurred. So you don't give up. You do is acknowledge it. Pick yourself up, put a smile on your face, and you go forward, and you figure out what the problem was, and you fix it, and you go forward. So, it is achievable, absolutely achievable. Um, you can develop a risk analysis plan from brass to glass, from the, from the environment you're in all the way to the end product. The entire continuum is in your risk management plan. So, you, you've done your intellectual push-ups. You've actually looked at the entire thing very carefully and studied it. You know it well. You know it better than anybody else in the world. What your farm presents as a risk profile. That's not my farm. That's not the guy in the North Pole. It's you. Because you have your environmental circumstances where you are. Your water sources, your environmental conditions, whether it snows, ice, where you get, you know, who milks your cows, what kind of milking systems you have. You milk by hand, with a machine, with milk line. What are your conditions on your farm? And you're able to identify the risk uh, profile of your farm and put programs in, in effect that actually control and manage them effectively. And we can help you with that. Um, we don't. We are not the raw milk police, by the way. We don't tell you that this is good and this is bad. What we say is develop all the risk profiles you can for your farm, and then we'll, we'll help you to understand them better and perhaps bring some technology in to understand how to manage them better. But monthly testing to uh, make sure that you're compliant with common standards really helps you bring it all online. This is a very interesting chart. I think you were in Pennsylvania, weren't you, five years ago? Yep. Okay. Well, interesting. After that, what happened? This is the risk profile of outbreaks in, um, in, in Pennsylvania that occurred prior to the training that occurred in Pennsylvania. Okay. And on that interesting day, there were like 22 farmers that were there that day. Um, it wasn't that that training caused this to occur, but it was the ripple effect of that training because farmers said, you know, we've got to really do this and we've got to really do that. You may not have become listed, but what happened was they recognized there was a standard out there, and people started saying, I need to clean up my act a little bit. And as a result, you only saw one outbreak after that, where before it was much higher. And it was interesting because the researchers looked at that and said, this was a very, very important thing that occurred because of the fact it became kind of the known standard, the high jump bar to get over. And as a result, you saw a dramatic shift of the risk profile drop, literally from what was going on crazy to, to very, very low. Not that it went away to zero, but risk management's not about zero. Think about airplanes. Very, very safe form of transportation, but they're not perfect. Things happen on airplanes. People die once in a while. Things, things happen with pasteurized milk. You have 84 people that have died from pasteurized milk in the last 50 years, uh, 45 years. 84. That doesn't mean pasteurization doesn't work, but it can fail. It can not work sometimes. Volvo is a really safe car, but people die in Volvos all the time. Bottom line is, it's risk management to bring it to a super low, ultra low uh, profile. Recent study done by um, Dr. Whitehead and, and Lake out of British Columbia um, studied raw milk in North America between Canada and the United States, the entire profile of raw milk. And they found there was a 78% decrease of recalls and illnesses in North America in the last five years. And there was a 357% increase in raw milk consumption unless that same profile. So having concern for risk management has had a major dramatic in the perspective of risk management in North America in terms of standards. And that mean, that doesn't mean we're done. It means we've got, got a good start and that something's working properly. We have a lot more work to do. But it, it is pretty important to, to understand that there is peer-reviewed evidence now in the literature, the PubMed literature, uh, that's published out there that's not denied by the FDA, CDFA, or uh, any organization, CDC. It's actually there. It's, it's peer-reviewed by scientists other than the actual publishing scientists themselves. So interesting profile change. 
Again, back to the kinds of milk we want to produce, so this kind of milk versus that. This comes from that uh, assessment done by Dr. Whitehead, showing this 159 samples done in British Columbia, the zero, 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 zero pathogens found in that milk. But yet, pathogens found in the uh, other profiles are significant. We're talking about huge camelback, 9%, 9, uh, pathogen E. coli, 3 All these have percentages of pathogens found in their milk samples versus zeros. And this is trained farmers that actually received training from the Raw Milk Institute up in British Columbia, where raw milk's illegal, by the way. Very black market up there, moonshine market. Um, but yet they're doing it under, undercover with high levels of standards and doing testing. Serious change in terms of testing a profile of milk intended for pasteurization, which has pathogens all through it, versus raw milk intended for human consumption with good training and standards. That's really good science. And so this is now in the peer-reviewed peer -reviewed literature. Here's another. This is California raw milk. We're having our problems here and there. No deaths, but challenges here and there. Outbreak here and there. There's five producers of raw milk in California, by the way. And this is all the cumulative data from those producers. But again, the last four years, a zero illnesses or outbreaks. Zero. So the expectations, not just the training, but the expectations that, hey, wait a minute, I better be doing some testing and I better clean up my act, has changed the profile of what's going on. With raw milk consumption going through the sky up here, it's going poof, like this. And we see now literally four and a half years there of zero happening. This is a dramatic shift. You see more consumption and fewer illnesses, or zero. That shows that the more raw milk that's out there doesn't mean that you're going to have more illnesses. It has to do with training and standards and testing. So this is really good science coming on. I think it's a big takeaway for everybody that when you clean up your act and do a good job of managing your milk, you actually have very few problems or very much fewer problems. Um, size doesn't matter. We've got a guy uh, back east that's actually doing, this is an ex-helicopter pilot, by the way. Uh, he's big into protocols. He, he was able to get into his, uh, become listed in about five weeks. Um, but all sizes, micro dairies as well as large, well, large dairies can both uh, do raw milk very well. It's easier to do on a micro dairy. There's fewer moving parts, fewer cows to look at. Um, but anyway, on the right-hand side, uh, that's not so good or less good. Uh, on the left-hand side, you have much, much better set of conditions. Sunshine is your friend. Pastures are your friend. Uh, pathogens could be here, but generally not present. Sunshine degrades them. Uh, the, the pastures themselves are actually a very nice place that blocks and prevents most pathogens because it's a digestive environment that's being constantly in renewal. Uh, the biome is alive there. Versus over here, if you've got antibiotics and hormones and lots of grain being fed and all kinds of stuff, the, the environment generally would support the growth of some pathogens, and they'll be present when tested. Um, so anyway, conditions matter, pastures, cows, udders, internal milk systems, all these things really play a big part. This is a very important book that I brought. Dr. Joseph Heckman, who's a director of the, uh, at the Raw Milk Institute, gave it to me. And it, it shows a, 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 a dairy, the Walker Gordon dairy. Anybody heard of the Walker Gordon dairy? I didn't know about it either until I sent it to me for Christmas. But it's a, a huge raw milk dairy that was in New Jersey. And it was founded back in 1900. And it operated until 1970. And in fact, Borden bought it in 1930. Borden just went bankrupt. But it was interesting that these guys had no reported outbreaks in 70 years. But they were intensively on-farm testing of the milk in labs at the uh, Walker Gordon Dairy. And it operated, in, it had 1,600 cows. They operated in 16 units. Every hundred cows had a different dairy, but all the milk was milked in one central rotary milk barn that they had. So you had all these subcontractors working for the large contractor that shipped that milk into New York, Boston, wherever it was being shipped on ice to be consumed by people. And it was part of the American Association of Medical Milk Commissions. So raw milk has a very wonderful dis distinction for being very safe uh, when conditions are being maintained properly. And you can see that there. Conditions were very, very meticulous producing raw milk at the Walker Morton Dairy. Gordon Dairy. They were the largest certified raw milk producer in the world from 1887 to 1971. Pretty interesting stuff. And they used the American Association of Medical Milk Commissions, which is a physician-based certification board that no longer exists. Um, they folded back in 1999. 
You know the, the last dairy that was certified by them? You know who that is? Altadena in Los Angeles. Stuvies Natural. It was kind of a genesis of why how we became producers of, our, uh, of, of, milk, of raw milk in California was um, in May of 1999, the Stuvie Brothers, which was part of this uh, Altadena brand, had gone out of business. They sold for millions of dollars to Dean's Foods. Interesting. And they stopped producing raw milk. Well, people wanted... You know, they wanted their raw milk from pasture-based cows. And we were the closest dairy to L.A. People started showing up at our dairy and saying, we want your milk raw. I said, what do you want? Because I was selling my milk to pasteurized or Gang Valley. That only lasted six months. And then we became producers of raw milk, selling our milk in L.A. to pick up that vacuum uh, that was left by this big producer in L.A. Here's kind of a graphic which is important to look at. You look at the grass and the glass and all those things in between. Look at all the conditions between the grass and the glass. The water is super critical. Where does your water come from? Is it a well? Is there manure water running down the well? You know, where is it coming from? Uh, is it a canal water? Is it city water? Is it chlorinated? Is it not chlorinated? It's your water. You test it once in a while. Make sure it's clean. Pasture conditions. Are your cows up against the fence and the guys next door have a bunch of beef cows that fit solar grains and have a bunch of, of uh, E. coli 0157H7 in the manure? We've seen... Those kind of cows transfer an E. coli 157H7 cows to our cows directly across the fence. Not our cows, but other farmers that have this. You want to make sure that you protect your cows from influence from wild critters. They've got TB. You don't want TB in your, in, for badgers or, or, I don't think badgers would be so much of a big thing, but certainly deer coming in with your, your herd. Uh, you want to look at pasture conditions and what's going on. Do you have any toxic weeds in your pastures? You get to use your pastures all year long. If you don't, where are the cows going when they're not in pasture? What your confinement facility look like? Is it bedded pack? Is it not bedded pack? Is it, uh, you know, what do you do? How do you keep the cows from just being a, a big mess uh, when it comes to the wintertime? Wild animals, udders. How do you clean your udders? What do you use to clean your udders? How do you, how do you go about doing that? Animal feed. Do you keep, how do you keep the animal feed clean? Is it moldy? What do you feed them? Cleaning. How do you go about doing that? Do you use tissue? Do you not clean them? Do you use water? Are their udders wet? Are they dry? Um, Temperatures in the wintertime. I've seen some dairies that tried to become Rami listed and we weren't able to certify them because they weren't willing to change their, their practices. This one dairy we, we saw had a milk line that was literally 100 feet long. It had a hot water tank that ran the water into a milk line and it acted like a, uh, a heat transfer or a heat, uh, you call it, uh, well, it's a heat transfer, but a heat exchanger. Because 100 feet in freezing conditions when it's minus 15 degrees, you know, try to milk your cows or whatever, you simply can't get your water temperature high enough to kill and clean your milk line. We say, hey, just transfer to a bucket system and you'll be good to go because your milk comes out of your cow into a bucket. It's a three-foot line. You can clean that and you're good. But if you try to run it through a 100, line, 100 feet of, of line, the, the exit temperature is going to be, you know, cold. You won't be able to get your kill step. So, you know, you have to really uh, uh, look at your temperatures in terms of is your hot, hot, your cold, cold. You know, is your clean, clean? Is your green, green? You have to really think about those things. Chilling. Are you going to wait around all day to chill your milk, or do you get chilled immediately? Does it come down to less than 40 degrees in 30 or 40 minutes? You want to have that milk clean. How, how many minutes does it take for milk bacteria counts that come out of the udder? And there's bacteria in the milk that comes out of the udder because the teat canal has bacteria. How many minutes does it take for that bacteria count to double? Any, any ideas? But you are right. You're a doctor, by the way. A doctor, a doctor not in medicine, but of, of a, a technical engineer guy. But you applied your brain in, in, in this. But 20 minutes, every 20 minutes, bacteria double at body temperature. So if you start out with a bacteria count of two coliforms and a standard plate count of 300, it's super clean, and you let it be warm for three hours, let me tell you, it's going to be really high because every 20 minutes, whatever's there is going to double. And that's where your shelf life goes. So if you have a super low bacteria count and you keep it super cold, super quick, you can get a long shelf life out of that because the bacteria doesn't grow when it's right next to freezing. Three or four degrees above freezing, the bacteria count grows really, really slow. And that's why you get that long, delicious shelf life. Uh, testing would be for, for coliforms and maybe for pathogens once in a while. But you don't need to do a lot of it. Just do enough to know that your systems are working. We embrace a little bit of a different program at Organic Pastures in Fresno because we have a lab that's literally 15 minutes away. And we have the technologies nowadays where BAX PCR, B-A-X-P-C-R-R-T, 
we're able to get data back in 12 hours. So by batch, we're able to put all the milking from a set of cows in a, in a tank. We have multiple tanks. And that tank, the milk sits there. We lock it off. It doesn't go anywhere. It's cold chilled. We take a sample of the lab every day, twice a day. And we know what's in that milk before the milk ever gets to the bottle because 12 hours only goes by. So we're able to know, and that, what well, I tell you, that decreases, you know, sleep really well at night knowing that I'm pasture free in my milk. Now we're fortunate in that regard. We're the only one doing that. Uh, Ed Shank is doing call form testing, which is giving him an idea whether safety systems are working, not pathogen testing, which is telling you the needle in the haystack. He's getting haystack conditions because he's saying, okay, the milk is very sanitary, therefore the risk profile is very low. That's true. So he's able to do that on farm with the lab. So you're able to actually do on farm testing for call forms, which are an indicator of cleanliness in literally 14 hours yourself, 12, 12 to 14 hours. And you can do that for a dollar a test yourself. Those are really cool. Uh, it, you don't have to run to a lab you don't have to ship it. You can do it on farm with petri film. 3M petri film will give you that data literally in half a day. So that's pretty cool to know that I've got call forms at two or three, and I know that when I'm doing that, everything's good. If your call form jumps to 800 or 50 or 60 or 50, you've got something coming out of a, of a mastitis. You've got something coming out of some dirt. You've got something going on. You know you probably don't want to ship that off to be consumed for the consumer. You want to make cheese out of it or feed the calves. You wouldn't give it to people. So it gives you an idea that everything's right, everything's good. So there's a lot of call form testing going on on farms, and that would be something I would encourage everybody to do, whether you're listed or not. It's something to do that's cheap, and it's very accurate, and it's fast. And it's, it's, it's a great tool. So testing and then training, always stay in school. There's always something coming towards you that you can learn from. Always stay open and, and learn and engage. One of the good things that Ramal Gistu does is we have – uh, every uh, uh, every four months or every three months, four times a year, we have a Zoom seminar. We all get together. We all share our stories. And we all uh, have an agenda. We go through things. To, what's the newest thing going on? And anybody who learns something, we can all learn from. So we all get on board a big conference call with Zoom so we can see each other's faces. Uh, and we actually get to know each other and actually build a community together to actually learn as much as we can. So from grass to glass, management of the risk profile of our milk. Um, when we do have good practices being used, uh, you have udders that are in good shape, you have body condition, udders, coats, uh, sunshine, grass when possible, uh, certainly sunshine if you've got it, <laughs> sometimes you don't in the wintertime. Clean, stripped, dipped, uh, dried before milking begins. Uh, these are all assumptions that you're gonna do that every time. The problem is not doing it one time. The problem is doing it every time. That's the challenge. Because I guarantee you, you're not going to milk the cows every day yourself, seven days a week. If you do, God bless you. But the bottom line is, you probably hire somebody or somebody else helps out, and that's what's going to happen on a Friday night when nobody's watching. So you've got to be careful that your protocols are very, very consistent. That's one of the take-homes here is, whatever you do, keep it simple, and always do it very, very consistently to assure that you have a very low-profile milk. Um, you've got to make sure everything's clean inside and out. Uh, when people come to look at your operations, you want to have them go, wow, I'm impressed. This is a clean-looking place. Not just the rose bushes out front, but inside the milk lines inside, you make sure things are well-maintained, things are polished, things look and smell clean. Because they don't look and smell clean, people get that impression and they take it away and say, that place didn't look and smell clean. So you want it to be inside. That's the testing portion to know what's going on inside your systems, but also maintained well. We've had dairymen, thought everything was great and wonderful, but failed to maintain their machine. This liner right here, if it has a crack inside, guess where the milk goes? It goes behind the liner in between the shell and the liner. We can build with stereo like crazy because when you do your CIP and clean inside of here, it doesn't clean in the liner. It doesn't clean behind the liner in the, in the, in the stainless steel shell. And guess what? When this uh, inflation pulsates back and forth, back and forth, the stereo that's in, out here inside behind the shell gets in the milk. So making sure that your, your inflations are replaced on a regular basis and making sure your equipment is maintained is absolutely critical to food safety. If you ever see any milk running up your vacuum lines, you go, whoa, it got behind my, my, uh, my inflation. Ever taken a look at this little thing right here? There is she. Right there. A little vacuum hole. A pinhole right there. It's a very much important part of the vacuum system and the pulsation system that it function. That little pinhole, is it covered in manure and water all the time? Because it's continuous suction. When, it's, when this is sucking and pulsating, that's sucking as well. This is the air release. So you want to make sure your machines are stepped really clean, including that little pinhole, which wouldn't matter in pasteurization, who cares, because it's going to get in, in the milk line, it's going to be pasteurized. But for raw milk, that's really important. 
keep that dry. So when you hang your machine up, hang it up out of the way so the cow takes a big pee or poop and they get all the machine. Keep that machine nice and clean. And when you put the machine on the udder, make sure you guide the, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the shells. Put on the machine without touching the legs and sucking everything up. Make sure you trim your tail so that the trail uh, is, is, is clean and that, in fact, you're not touching this against the leg of the, of the, of the cow. And then you've done a really good job of prepping the cow's udder. So when you put the machine on, you're not sucking everything to the environment. When you take the machine off, put it away so that it doesn't get in the environment where the cow poops and pees and gets sucked into the milk. Super important to manage your machine and keep it super clean and maintain it well. Take it all apart for every few months and replace the, all the parts of it. That's why really safe, good, clean raw milk isn't cheap. Taking these things apart and putting new parts costs a little bit of money. That's got to go to some place and it's got to, the consumer's got to pay for it or else you're not breaking even. So it's really important to maintain your equipment properly and to assure that you have a protocol for making sure all the parts are well maintained. Where the rubber hits the, the stainless, there's a little place where that, there's a little ring around there, and that's where bacterial biofilms will actually be created. And we'll talk a little bit more about biofilms. Biofilms are a really important thing to realize. Uh, could be your worst, worst enemy. Chilled quickly, tested. Um, you, you should get a long, nice shelf life, at least two weeks. And there shouldn't be any bubbles rising in your milk after a few days. Bubbles rising in your milk, what does that mean? That means that bacteria are actually creating carbon dioxide, and that's carbon dioxide bubbles coming up in the milk. If you don't have those bubbles, then you don't have that, that process going on. So you want to make sure that you don't have any bubbles in your milk, which is kind of a naive perspective, kind of a uh, consumer's way to look at um, whether you have bacteria growing in your milk or not. So here's some stuff. This is uh, Charlotte Express. She was the, the first Roma producer in North America to be listed by the Roma Institute back in, in uh, 2012. And very, very, it's all about mindset. Mindset. Focus like a laser to make sure you're doing all these things, that you know what you're doing. You have a plan to success. You're diligent in it. You're dedicated. Conditions, healthy cows, maintained areas, uh, very organized. This is not a great any set of conditions, as you know. There's no stainless there. Uh, it's, it's kind of a wooden environment. But she was able to achieve extremely low bacteria counts by just having everything very clean and organized. Um, very clean udder. Uh, watching the uh, udders, make sure that the doesn't lose the machine off the others. Uh, monitoring the process, stress free conditions, really keeping things well organized and clean. Taking the milk directly with the bucket into a separate area which is clean for bottling. And then doing the bottling in a clean environment. Don't do it right there by the cow, but you do it in a clean environment where you have control. And do that very quickly. Um, chill it rapidly, and you notice there's no uh, water over the top of the bottle, but this is a half gallon uh, container, a glass container in a cow share type environment where you would actually submerge it in ice water, which would give it a very low temperature within literally 30 or 40 minutes. Um, keep it cold as well. Here's large scale. That's my son, Aaron. He did red beard last year. Uh, uh, cows on pastures, bigger operations here. This is our purpose-built milk barn. This is actually showing a tour of consumers that are actually coming out to see us one day. One day. Um, healthy cows, maintained areas. Remember, put our machines up nice and high, so if they peep or poop, poor poop down here, they don't get on the machine, it's nice and high. Make sure your udders are very clean. We wash our udders at least twice, uh, actually three times if necessary. Uh, you know, we have a shower system uh, where tepid water is used to wash the udders. Then they come in, and we wash them again if there's any visible uh, uh, moist, uh, dirt on them. Then we drip dry, and then we dry them completely with the towel, pre-dip, strip, look at the mouth quality, the machine on, and then post-dip. And that's done religiously twice a day, every day. Um, unique to our operations is the guys that are actually doing the milking are very well trained, extremely well dedicated. But we put a system in place where they get the same bacteria count back on our cell phones as they get on their cell phones. Everybody gets the lab test back. They get a bonus every time that, that test looks good. So they lose their bonus if they don't get a good test. So there's a system going on when I'm sleeping and they're working at night, 2 o'clock in the morning, where... I know that they're doing the best job they can because looking for the money on the human behavior loop side. So it's kind of important to understand that. Here's other sets of conditions in our milk barn area, in our uh, milk holding area. And these are individual batch tanks here. Temperature, um, watching the temperatures, which is obviously you can use a thermometer. It's just as, as accurate. Um, and then 
Look at pastures, adequate space, rotated to pastures, perimeter fencing, a lot of things we've already talked about. Watch out for other things that are going on, chickens and pigs, uh, right up next to cows or in the cows. Uh, water, touched on that earlier. Water is the transfer mechanism, by the way. Moisture is what moves bacteria. So you want to make sure that dry conditions around your udders are super critical. Dry conditions for your machines, uh, everything, you don't want to have water either. Um, test negative for brucellosis and tuberculosis and Yonis disease. Uh, cow wasting disease, the cows will be eating a lot, but yet really skinny with really runny diarrhea. You don't want any of that kind of cow. Skinny cows that eat a lot with runny diarrhea, get them out of there. That's Yonis disease, or it could be. Uh, you want to make sure that they have adequate uh, feed to assure body condition. Very important to keep body condition because a cow that's under stress or loses body condition is a cow that's going to have an immune system issue to have, be susceptible to actually having problems herself. Um, we found that one of the highest profile animals in our herd that produces pathogens is a fresh cow. Her udder is in, a, in turmoil, right? Just gave birth, swelled udder, that's when she can have the highest potential for a pathogen from inside the udder. Not from the manure. I'm talking about inside the udder. We've seen it several times in the last 10 years where, and not only in our dairy, but other dairies where you see a pathogen coming from inside the udder from inflammation right at freshening within two weeks of freshening. So the time to test that cow uh, individually and culturing would be within 10 days of freshening. That's a very important profile there. Um, Make sure you uh, separate any cow with mastitis. Last security, uh, you wouldn't go buy a bunch of not-so-good cows from an auction and bring them into your herd. You want to keep a closed herd as much as possible. You want to uh, decrease the amount of contact of, of your animals to other animals so you have a closed environment by which they don't communicate bad bugs with other animals. Uh, this is where you got a uh, wild, whatever the heck it is, baby gazelle, I don't know, uh, running around in the herd. Uh, probably not such a good thing because you have no idea what this animal is in terms of running around with nature out there. Um, be cautious. You want to make sure that you separate your animals from uh, the wild animals. Um, cows and their babies. Cows. Cows are big communicators of pathogens. So having cows suck on calves, great, wonderful. But after you get them in the herd, probably not such a great idea anymore because calves have a higher rate of pathogens, higher than any other uh, group in the entire uh, farm herd environment. Contaminated equipment, um, you want to make sure that you uh, have your um, equipment, if you have automatic dosing going on into your milk lines for cleaning of your systems, make sure that that's calibrated properly and you're actually injecting your soap, that it's actually working. We've seen problems where people have their soap injector going into an automatic cleaning system, and that soap injector got clamped, and it, or they ran out, and so they're running with water with no soap. It's like, oh, why would my bacteria counts go through the roof? We've seen people say, oh, my cleanser's not working. Well, their, their chlorine bottle was sitting in the sunshine for three years, and it's no better than salt water. So be sure that whatever you're using to clean is actually potent and working. Um, insects and wildlife... If you keep things clean, generally you're not going to have insects trying to eat on that surface area because there's no food to eat. So clean is very important. Uh, make sure that the people who are doing the milking themselves are healthy. If you have a veterinarian coming to your farm and he's coming on a Friday, he's been going to other people all week long. Have him come on a Monday. Make sure he comes clean because the bottom line is he could be the worst contamination thing going on as well. And they're the first ones to admit it because they've been coming from another source, another farm. Um, so it needs to be cautious of that. And that advice came from a veterinarian himself. <laughs> so, um, again, biosecurity, very important to not uh, purchase lactating animals from other dairies. If you do, segregate them for a few weeks and watch them closely before you put them in their herd, in your herd, because you're asking for that lactating animal to become part of your milk environment, and you don't want to have a problem there. Don't share bulls with other herds. If you do, be cautious because they could be cross-contaminating uh, in the manure that they share with your herd, things that are in another herd and bring in problems. Uh, test, test all of any cows you purchase. Just do a whole, just invest in that the testing to make sure that they culture negative for the bad bugs you don't want on your farm. Um, separation, like three yards away from fence to fence with livestock areas, is kind of important. Um, 
We want to see a segregation of livestock for a few weeks to watch them closely to make sure that uh, you do have that quarantine set up. Uh, you want to clean your hands, your boots before going to other areas, separating uh, airspace and water supply. All these things should be on your mind in terms of thinking about the conditions you're creating for your herd. Okay. Uh, you want to build a culture of cleanliness. You can't expect your dairy people to be clean unless you provide incentive and a method by which to be clean. If all you have is a dirty environment and no means to get clean, you're going to have a dirty environment. But if you have hand washing and you have ways to wash your feet or do change your boots and you create a culture where they know they're supposed to be clean, you will have a clean environment. But if you don't, then you won't. Uh, chickens roosting above where you milk your cows, probably not good for Campylobacter or Salmonella. Um, easy access to hand washing, boot wash areas. All these things should be easy, part of your environment. Uh, confinement areas should be maintained and clean, no chickens. Um, whatever you've got, just take really good care of it. Keep your milking equipment clean. Uh, follow the recommended manufacturer suggestions as far as maintenance is concerned. Keep your vacuum pressures low. You don't want to be above about 12 and a half, 13. Keep as low as you can. Higher the vacuum pressure on your, your pulsation systems, the more uh, of a risk you have for mastitis and problems. The vacuum hole we talked about, make sure it's clean, make sure it's dry. Uh, not good. It's not in the milk, but it's on the environment near the milk. Um, we talked about this already, but you know, want to make sure you have a dry environment, uh, that it's prepared properly, that it's well lit, you can actually see with light what's going on there. Pre-depth with a solution, probably a, a, an iodine-based solution. Um, strip it, and then put the machine on. We use showers. You may not use showers, that's fine. But we use showers in California. It's, it's nice and warm there. The cows love it, and it eliminates the uh, belly fly habitat. So you don't have belly flies in your cows because the showers actually disturb the ability of the cows to actually uh, lay eggs in the bellies. Use a post Say it again? Do you use a post dip? Yes, we do. Post dip every cow. Because remember that the heat canal stays open for about 30 to 40 minutes afterwards. You need to protect it from the <coughs> uh, Wet environments are not good. Dry, dry or hairy, not good. Um, make sure your heat dip it does not become a contamination in its own right. Uh, we can use a spray, but make sure if you do use a spray that's thoroughly sprayed on the heat, uh, that's very important. So, sorry, you don't like that dip? You can use it. Just be aware that you want to make sure you if it's clean and fresh, not something that's filled with a bunch of manure. I've seen teat dip containers filled with manure. It's like, what? You know, you want to make sure that if you're using a teat dip, make sure that it's a clean teat dip. Uh, post dip with an iodine based solution to make sure that, uh, in fact, you don't have anything going up inside the udder to ensure that they don't get mastitis from laying down manure out in wherever they are. Protect your rags. Make sure that they're nice and clean uh, and beware of contamination potential there. Okay. Details make all the difference. They really, really do. And what you need to do is take a very complex set of circumstances and reduce them and make them simple. Make them easy. You don't want to do anything that's hard. You want to make whatever you've got going on easy so it's compliant. You're doing it all the time. So if you need to change some things to make things simpler, that would be better for you because it makes things more consistent. Keep it simple, keep it short, keep it sweet, right? Um, keep clean, clean. Whatever is supposed to be clean, keep it that way. Keep whatever's green, keep it that way. Don't let your pastures become a big capo environment. Uh, keep whatever's hot. Make sure you have consistent heat, that it's hot, hot, and cold, cold. Those are really, really key points to keep. This is your low point. It's the udder. Everything after that gets higher. So make sure you maintain all these environments so that going into that low point, when you're milking the cows, that man-made conditions don't make it any worse. Chill it and keep it clean. And that means the pathway that the milk goes through has to be kept clean. No biofilms. Short distance between the cow and the milk container. That's very important. Keep it short, keep it simple. Um, talked about that already. That already. Well lit, lighted, covered. Ensure adequate lighting. This is actually uh, in New York. This is Abby Rockefeller's Churchtown Dairy, who's listed by Ronald Institute. The correct kind of containers. This is not approved, that is approved. Stainless steel in the uh, ages old uh, product, food for grade A. Remember that rust, metal, the ferrous ion is needed for pathogen growth. So you don't want any steel 
to become rusted because that iron is necessary for the bacteria to actually grow pathogens. Uh, if you don't have iron, then it has a very hard time. Your pathogens are hard to grow. Um, know what's clean, keep it that way. Know what's not clean, keep it separated. If they ever cross, start over. And just and like It's just like in an operating room. The same kind of principles are there. Keep your stuff that's used in a vat versus on the floor separated. Got different equipment for different uses. Uh, water baths, if you want to do that. Uh, you don't have to. You can change your shoes instead of going in. Whatever's a clean environment, keep it that way. You don't want puddles standing on the floors. You want everything to drain to, to the, uh, the drains. If you have milk cases, which you probably don't, but if you do, make sure that you have them clean because they can become a very serious contamination problem. And also watch out for um, uh, freezer freeze up. Curtains work well, but keep them clean as well to contain your coldness. Uh, positive air pressure in filling rooms. It keeps the flies from running in the room. So pressurize your filling rooms and have that air be filtered so that you have uh, flies out. Because flies come up to a door that has air blowing towards them, they generally don't go through the door. So you want to have screens and flies being blown out of the room because it's pressurized. Take good care of it. Biofilms. This is the last things, so and we can wrap up here. On the surface of stainless steel, you may think, oh, it's nice and clean. But let me tell you what. Butter fat and protein and sugars from milk will build up on the surface of something that you want to stay, keep nice and clean. And it may not even be visible. But you'll find that they build small communities. And they become attached to those surfaces. And they get bigger and bigger and bigger if they don't become cleaned at every cleaning. And as they get bigger, they build a microcolony and then become a big, mature biofilm. In that biofilm, pathogenic bacteria hang out. That's what it's like big skyscrapers in a little community. And they hide out in there, and it's hard for the hot water or the soaps and the cleansers to get them out because they're hidden in there. And what do they do? They re enter into the milk flue later when milk comes along. And so you've got these really bad, weird bugs sitting in there. You do not want this. You want stainless steel and milk and nothing else. So very important that if you have a crack in your in rubber or you have a joint or a valve or you have anything that perhaps create this biofilm, the here area with biofilm that builds up, you want to make sure that you get rid of those. Uh, Soapstone, yep. Yeah. Rust is important, too. Rust. You don't want any rust because pathogens are, have affinity to the iron and rust. So... Make sure that what's in contact doesn't have rust. Pathogens love. You shouldn't have rust anyway because guess what? Stainless steel requires, I mean, uh, grade A requires stainless steel, plastic, and rubber, not uh, something that would have rust. If you have rust, clean it off really, really good and spray paint it with some kind of a rust inhibitor or zinc or something. But this is a super important problem here to address is make sure you do not have biofilms. One of the best ways to not have biofilms is don't have equipment to begin with. Start from the cow and go to the, the, the product as short as possible. Bucket milkers are a great way to do that. If a long milk line, you're asking for lots of problems with milk line. You can manage milk lines. Just be aware. Biofilm city. Be careful with that. You get off flavors, all kinds of problems. The, the actual container where you're actually storing your milk. If you're putting milk on top of each other. You're having multiple milkings in one tank. Be cautious of that. You could contaminate good milk with bad milk. So be cautious with biofilms. Uh, quorum sensing, I won't get into that. If you want to know more about it, we've got a whole thing on quorum sensing. Just realize that when bad bugs get together, they do bad things. And they talk to each other at the cellular level. They change information uh, with DNA. Biofilms break this uh, safe haven for bad bugs, and you do not want to have that biofilm getting into your milk. It becomes contamination and bad news. Big problems are valves, gaskets, low points, bends. All these things are opportunities for biofilms. And you want to make sure that you clean everything. Valves are taken apart. The uh, valves are completely disassembled and, and all those parts. That's why you, the fewer the valves, the fewer the hoses, the fewer the systems, the better. So, short and simple and, and cleaner. Clean and play systems. We don't play fair with bacteria. We'll go alkaline for a while. We'll go acid for a while. We'll go back and forth because, remember, they become resistant. Bacteria love life on Earth. And you need to not play fair with them. Lots of high temperature, hot water, boiling hot water as well as changing from acid to bases back and forth will be very good as far as keeping uh, things clean. All right, I'm over time here, so I'm going to make this quick here. But pipelines and tanks, all these things are things you look at. Milk stacking, we talked about that. Pasteurized milk risk. Pasteurization causes listeria uh, to be a risk profile, which is increased. Listeria dies in pasteurization, but it is an opportunity after pasteurization. Listeria loves a pasteurized milk. 
So very important to think about that. Case, cases, watch them closely. Camelbacter burst nest. And then you've got, let's see, whatever. Wash your bottles. You guys have bottles at your cow shares. Make sure those bottles are super clean and dry. And, and train your consumers to keep them clean and return them clean. Uh, metal lids, make sure you don't have a metal lid that actually has rust on it. Use plastic lids if you can. And testing. Um, torn inflation liners, biofilms, all these things can actually cause uh, problems from inside the udder. So be very, very careful. Make sure that you do testing once in a while. Don't be fooled by the fact you think everything's clean on the outside. Make sure you're ch checking from the inside. That means testing the milk once in a while. Filters once in a while. Common standards, they're here available. I won't get in this, or this, or this, or this, or this. Um, some testing results here. Uh, more testing results. All this is technical stuff. Test protocols, simple to do. You develop it on your farm. And these are the bacteria counts you can get. We're looking at average of two. I'm sorry, I just killed myself. <laughs> they do better. Basically, in summary, because that's going to take a while to go back up, you need to get through the next presentations. We're really encouraging you to look at these profile, these tests, and all this information is available at the Rommel Institute. You can do it yourself. You can look at this stuff and, and understand it. Um, it's not hard to do. It just takes diligence to do it. And as a result, you get a lot of really good things out of it. You get long shelf life. You get very low risk product, and you get very happy consumers. You have bragging rights as well. You can use the Rommel Institute logo. You can link it to our website. So you can actually have your website connected to our website and get a portal for the testing you do to actually show off what you can do. You can say things on our website you can't say on your website because ours is a nonprofit and yours is for commercial purposes. So with that said, you have any questions, any thoughts? We wrap up here. I pulled myself. I unplugged myself, unfortunately. What's some of your tests run when you're farming, like call the farm, for example? Uh, if you're going to do your own on-farm testing, it would literally be one dollar or two dollars. Ours is like you do it all, all, already. But that would be just a couple bucks. Yeah. Well, I was thinking more. Milk on your farm is it all farm zero consistently or two? No, it goes up and down. It goes up and down. We'll run two to three, and then we'll have a twenty-five. It's like okay, what happened? We'll get right back on it and figure out what's going on and get back down to two or three. Uh, but having a twenty-five is not the end of the world at all. Uh, when the FDA allows seven hundred and fifty for pasteurized milk. And coliforms are not pathogenic. They're just an indicator of, of, of cleanliness. You want to reestablish yourself and get back down to that low coliform level. You want your SPC counts to be down in the hundreds, not thousands. And they should be if you've done a good job of showing. So, um, yeah. Um, it's in uh, the standard, the lower than the standard. Oh, a fraction of it. <laughs> That's why you should get a premium for your product as well. Um, the beneficial bacteria found in milk are wonderful for the gut. They're not to be excluded. They're there. They're there for, for a reason. Um, they need to be there, but you need to have them at low levels. They'll explode in growth in your gut. That's what it's supposed to do, but not before it gets to your gut. You need to have the milk uh, be clean and fresh and, and everything, unless you want to intentionally make kefir, right? Extremely high bacteria count, the fermented product with 3.8 uh, pH and long shelf life because it's already fermented. It's like yogurt. We are always welcome to questions. You can always call, and we always email really quickly in terms of getting answers back to you. So thank you very much. I've gone five minutes over time, and I unplugged myself accidentally. I'm sorry. My conclusive statement was basically, what are we going to do together for the future? And it shows a nice sunrise with, hey, let's work together, because we really want to have a, a community of people working together that have very high standards and excellent outcomes. So consumers love us, and the FDA and Big Airy Dairy Dairy respect us, because they know that they, they know they can't do what we do. All right, guys? All right. Uh, you guys have... Yeah, yeah. <laughs>